Let's all go to Acts, the 24th chapter of Acts. Acts 24. Acts 24 and 16. Acts 24, 16, Paul said, by the inspiration of the Spirit, he said, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and Toward men, the word "towards" in italics. When you see them like that, that means it wasn't in the original text. So it just means toward God and men. The NIV says, "I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man, uh, uh, without offense." That has to do with you your conscience being offended. This is something that's happening inside him. And he said, I'm, I'm always making an effort, I'm always on that to keep my conscience where it's not bothering me, where my conscience is clear between me and God and between me and people. And he said, I do this all the time. Do you reckon we should do this yes. all the time? Yes, sir. We began a series a few weeks ago entitled A Clear Conscience. And if you haven't been with us, we've already covered a lot of ground, foundation. Let me encourage you to go online and download the previous messages. Or if you're in the building, you can go back in the Word Supply and get you a CD or DVD. It won't cost you anything. Anybody been reading your chapters yes. of late? Yes. Boy, isn't it rich? Yes. I'm telling you, these epistles, the, all the Word of God, but you know, these are written to us, not just about us or for us. They're written to us, to the churches. And uh, if you're not reading these and feeding on them, you're really missing out. So uh, it, it's, it should be widely known that everybody at Faith Life Church reads their chapter every day, Monday through Friday. Now, if you want to read a bunch of chapters on Saturday, that's wonderful. Or Sunday, that's wonderful. But do this at least. And if you're not with us, if you read one chapter in the New Testament every day, Monday through Friday, five days a week, you have read the New Testament through in its entirety in one year. Just one chapter. And... Uh, uh, what I have found is if I won't try to take in too much at one time, if I just go over a part, I keep getting new things that I hadn't seen before. And sometimes if it's the chapter of the day, I'll, I'll listen to it and read it and listen to it, you know, maybe ten times or something throughout the day. And, and boy, that you start. <laughs> uh, what, one of the things I'm enjoying 30-some uh, years into our ministry now is uh, I'm beginning to see some cohesiveness. I'm beginning to see, um, you know, the Bible talked about that the, the Israelites saw God's uh, uh, acts, but Moses knew his ways. And you're beginning to see uh, some of God's ways in things and, and, and beginning to connect some dots, thinking, well, that goes with this, and this goes with that, and that goes with the other. And, and uh, oh, thank God. But you know, some things just take time. And if you don't get started at it early, you, uh, you know, you won't go as far. And the Lord's merciful. He'll bless you as much as he can. But you know, and some things, uh, even if they could ask you, there, there's some questions a, a three and four and five year old can ask you that you just can't answer. Right. You could answer them and tell it, you could tell it to them exactly the way it is, 
and they'd look at you with a blank look on their face. They would not know what you're talking about. They hadn't lived long enough. They don't have the life experience. They don't have the understanding to make the connections. And when the Lord calls us his little children, it's not a figure of speech. <laughs> we really are little ones to him. And there's been some things I've asked him just in my few years of walking with him. And uh, uh, one thing in particular, uh, I asked, uh, I prayed, I said, Lord, show me what that means. I mean, that's one of the good things about reading the Word. If you read the Word on a regular basis, uh, it, it keeps you from being delusional about knowing too much. <laughs> There are preachers and, and so-called scholars and stuff around that are just so argumentative and so adamant about, you know, this and that and the other. And if you get to talking to them, you realize they are so pitifully ignorant of the Word. And that's part of what feeds their delusion. But when you're humbly reading the Word on a regular basis, you are continuously coming across things that you go, I don't see that yet. I haven't experienced that yet. Hadn't got there yet. Wow, still don't know what that means. <laughs> huh? And it has a humbling effect on you, doesn't it? And it, it brings you back to reality. In fact, the Bible said when uh, the Lord gave instruction to the kings of Israel, and one of the instructions was that they were to have a personal copy of the Word of God, and they were to read in it all the days of their life so that their heart wouldn't get lifted up in pride. Interesting, huh? <laughs> and so uh, they're just, that's, reason 3009 why you should read your chapter every day at least right so if you hadn't been doing it you know please join us go back to the information area get your bookmark it shows what chapter we're reading on what day and you know and literally we're all on the same page aren't we literally so uh, and when you're in one mind and one accord good things happen don't they uh, Acts 24, 16, he said, I strive always to keep my conscience clear. Go to Romans, please, the um, second chapter. And I would ask you, please, to believe with me this evening. There are some wonderful things I would like for us to get to. I mean... Life changing things. Wonderful. Uh, I want to talk in tongues to try to tell you how wonderful it is, but it's life changing. But I can't express anything. I can't have utterance unless He gives it. And you nor I, either one, can see anything unless He reaches in and opens our eyes and, and mine. Uh, no man or woman can reveal light and truth to another man or woman cannot do it. God can use you to speak it out, but unless, the, uh, unless and until the Spirit of God reaches inside you and turns the light on for you, you don't see it. But uh, let, let's just come into agreement right now in faith about this. Father, you said uh, where two or three of us are gathered together, you'd be right here in the midst of us. And so we say, according to your word, you're here, right here. You are our teacher. You are our guide. You lead us by your spirit into all truth. And we ask you and agree as touching this thing for utterance, uh, for your presence strong and powerful, for light and truth that enlightens us and renews our mind and fills us with your light and your life. Help us to break out of and break free from deceptions and ignorance and religious tradition and anything that has kept us out of your way and out of your, your way of life and truth and out of your word. In Jesus' name we ask for it. Jesus name. Amen, so be it. Romans 2. 
Romans 2. And verse uh, 1, I believe, will start. Romans 2. Well, for time's sake, skip down to verse 15. Because <clears throat> if I get into all that, I may get excited. And, <laughs> and if I try to preach all that, whew. We're believing to be led, aren't we? Yeah. Romans 2, 15. Well, back up to uh, 13. What are y'all laughing about? <laughs> Some of this I've never taught like this before. And, you know, when you've got 10 pages of notes and all these things going on, you have to, have to narrow it down. And the Holy Spirit's helping us with that. Uh, Proverbs 2 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Verse 14, when the Gentiles which have not the law, he's talking about non-Jewish, outside the covenant, grew up worshiping idols, Baal, Ashtaroth, didn't know anything about the Ten Commandments, didn't know anything about God, the one true God. When they get saved, then by nature, they are doing the things that are contained in the law, but they've never read the law. And they never heard the law. And they're a law unto themselves. That means that the law, the spirit of the law is in them. Why? Because the author of the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy is now inside them. Thank you, Lord. And even though they never heard it, He's showing them you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't commit adultery. And, and, and that, that they're seeing these truths and they never heard it. Verse 15, and this is how the Spirit of God is guiding these new Gentile Christians. The work of the law is written in their hearts. You know, the, the prophet prophesied that in that day, he said, they'll not say every man to his brother, know the Lord. He said, because they'll all know me. Amen. From the least to the greatest, he said, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more, and my laws I will write them on their hearts. That's not in a book, that's in your heart. That's right. And the author of the Bible is writing it inside you. And, and he says, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now this is a detailed picture, uh, an explanation of how our conscience works. And how you can know things that you were never taught. You can know right and wrong. You can know good and bad without anybody telling you, without being taught. Their, their conscience is bearing witness and their thoughts accusing or excusing. These things are going on inside us all the time. But by and large, even Christians are not taught to pay attention to it. You hear it? All too often, people say something bad happened, some loss, some destruction, some accident, and you hear Christians say, I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew we shouldn't have gone there. I knew we should. If you knew it, why didn't you do it? Right. Come on. Now, I'm not throwing any stones because I've missed it myself. That's right. Haven't you? Yeah. But the question is, if we knew it, why didn't we do it? Something inside us was letting us know. But we weren't paying attention to it. And sadly, even in churches, good people that love God can, can grow up in church and be middle-aged and were never really taught to pay attention to their conscience. 
That's unacceptable. Right. So that's why we're on it. Amen. Right? Yeah. Right now. And if we didn't get enough of it early on, well, there's no need looking back. Well, let's get a good double dose of it right now and get caught up and make adjustments and make changes. Do you understand, friends, that somebody else other than you lives inside of you? The great, mighty, holy spirit. He communicates to you. That's worth shouting about right there. He communicates with you. God the Almighty, the Holy Spirit who hovered and moved over the face of the deep. The same Holy Spirit that, that was in Jesus and all the miracles and healings. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. He's in you. Is this scripture? Yes. It's truth. He's in you. He's in me. He does not communicate to us through our flesh. We're not supposed to try to hear from God with our eyes, our ears, nor with our mind, with our reasoning, with our logic, nor with our emotions, our feelings. And this has not been taught enough. Romans 8, you're there in Romans, just hold your place there in, in the second chapter, go over to chapter 8, Romans 8 and 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Sons of God can be, should be, led not by their feelings, not by their reasonings, not by majority rule. Not by committee, right. Mm -hmm. not by public opinion, right. That's right. That's right. but by what? You're not supposed to be led by needs. You're not supposed to be led by opportunities. There's a whole list of things you're not supposed to be led by. He was well, man, there's a great need. A need is not a leading. Well, they, you know, they're pulling on me. They're pressuring me. Pressure is not a leading. Hmm? I'm tired of fooling with it. Being tired is not a leading. <laughs> Are y'all with me? We must learn to discipline ourselves and make all of our decisions based on this. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord. With all your heart. That's where your conscience is. On the inside of you. And do what with your understanding? He didn't say you couldn't use it. But that's not what you rely on to make your decisions. Yes, find out what you can find out. God gave you a head. Use it. <laughs> But that's, you don't just analytically weigh it all out and come to the most logical decision and do it. Any sinner could do that. You look, you find out what you can find out and you look for the witness. Hmm? And if your heart bothers you, if your conscience bothers you about something, do not, I repeat, do not override your conscience. I don't care who's doing what. The Lord has spared this church, the ministry, Phyllis and I personally, a number of times. Problems with finances or problems of getting off in this area or that. There's been, I don't mean once or twice, I guess over the last 30 plus years, there's probably been a dozen times that people were getting excited about this particular doctrine or this particular teaching 
or everybody's doing this, or everybody's having these kind of meetings, or everybody's inviting this particular kind of speaker or these particular kind of people. Why haven't you done it, Brother Keith? Why aren't you do Simple. Well, you don't like them? I like them fine. <laughs> Why, you know, you got something against this? No. Well, why don't you do this? We've had people contact us and want to do this and want to do that. And, and, and why wouldn't you do it? I don't have to have a reason not to do it. That's right. Come on. That's right. I have to have a leading to do it. Let me go over again that real slow. I don't have to have a reason not to do it. I shouldn't do it. No matter how popular it is. See, if I do it because it's popular, what am I being led by? Huh? If I do it because somebody's pushing me, because somebody's going to get mad at me if I don't do it, what am I being led by? Can you see this? If I'm, you know, concerned that somebody's going to think I'm not with it, I'm not on the cutting edge. Huh? Brother Keith's missing the boat. <laughs> then if, I, if I do something because of that, what am I being led by? I'm being led by what I think they think. And I don't even really know what they think. But even if I was crystal clear on what they think, should I be led by what they think? Or should all of us be led by the Spirit of God, by the witness? Verse 16. Verse 16, what does it say? The Spirit itself, or as most translations say, Himself. The Spirit Himself bears witness with what? Not our body, not our mind, not our emotions, our spirit, the inside of us, the core of us. When the Bible talks about your heart, again and again, it's not talking about your physical blood pump. You can't believe God with your physical blood pump any more than you could believe God with a kidney or with your lung. But you should think of it like this. You know what the heart of a watermelon is. You know what the heart of an oak tree is. What is it? It's the core. It's the centermost part. And that's what he's talking about. Our core, that's where the Spirit of God is. And he bears witness with our spirit. We should pay close attention. We should monitor this all the time. Every situation. A lot of Christians, bless their hearts, are gullible. They're easy marks for con men and con women. All a lot of folks got to do is come in and say, brother this and brother that, and just have faith, and they'll give them their money. Not smart. Hmm? You're supposed to trust God completely without seeing or feeling. Or without understanding. You do not transfer that kind of faith to people you don't even know. Well, we're supposed to love them. Love them and trust in them are two completely different things. I know uh, some years ago, there were some folks trying to get... Uh, a lot of people were investing in this thing. And everybody was excited about it. And they were going to get rich and all this is going to happen. And a lot of good talk about what they were going to do, good things with the money. And it sounded good to me too. They said, you want to get in on it? And I thought, yeah. <laughs> and we didn't have much money, but, you know, uh, we thought we could, maybe we could put together a little bit and, and that'd be wonderful. And uh, time came for us to meet with the people and, and put our money in and this and that. And, and uh, I hadn't prayed that much about it. And the morning before, I'm, I'm praying, I'm seeking the Lord. I said, Lord, you know, what, what about this? 
uh, you hadn't said anything to me about it. He said, exactly. <laughs> he said, you have no reason to trust these people because I haven't said anything to you about it. They're a brother. They're a sister. They're well spoken of. A lot of our friends are in deep with them. You know, uh, the Lord told uh, Peter when he was up on the house, he fell into that vision. He said, there are men at the door. I've sent them. Go with them. Not asking any questions. Now, unless the Lord does that, you need to ask some questions. And you don't just go. He said, he said, I haven't said anything to you about them, so you have no reason to trust them. They're quoting scriptures. They're talking about amazing returns. They're talking about this. They're talking about that. And you got to watch if you get more excited about this deal than you are Philippians 4.19. Because what happens now is you're beginning to take your faith out of the Word of God and into something you can see, something you're hearing about. And the Lord can use any number of things and ways to bless you and do things for you, but you never get more excited about some deal or something going on than you do the Word. Is this okay? And you don't just trust somebody because they quote some scriptures and tell you they're a brother. This one particular person, if the Lord said that, then I thought, well, that's it. I'm not giving a dollar. And, but I already had a meeting. So we went. And so I just thought, well, I'll ask some questions. And I asked this question. They said, well, you just have to trust God. I thought, hmm? I know about trusting God. I didn't ask you to tell me how to trust God. I asked you about this deal. <laughs> how many know that's a red flag? It's a red flag. Well, you, do, you just have to give me the money and I'll take care of it. I said, well, no, we'll go over there. We'll show up. Uh, we want to see it with our eyes. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. Can't do that. Well, I can see already why the Lord told us, you've got no reason to trust these people. I didn't tell you anything about them. Why well, am I saying all this? Because just because you're a believer doesn't mean you're supposed to blindly trust everybody. You're to trust God. Yes. He's never lied to you. People, another story. He's never failed you. People, oh boy. Right? We trust God completely without seeing or knowing or understanding. You don't trust every person like that. It doesn't mean you don't love them. But it's, you, you don't have, a, have to have a reason not to do it. Hmm? I've had minister buddies and friends go, why don't you do this meeting with me? Why don't you come to my place? Why don't you come to my church? You don't like me? I'm like, quit it. <laughs> you know, some people having a relationship with them is just too high maintenance. <laughs> A lot of my friends, you know, people like Brother Copeland and Brother Jesse and Brother Jerry Savelle, those guys, I cannot see them for two years. And we can show up and it's just like we're never apart. We, we don't need anything from each other. We're not pulling on each other. There's my buddy. Yay, just pick up where you left off. None of this, why hadn't you called me? Maybe because I didn't want to hear that whiny thing. <laughs> Why haven't you been to our place? Why don't you like us? And I don't need a reason not to come. <laughs> I need a reason to go. Yes, hallelujah. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Lord. If I'm somewhere else. Instead of here with you on a Sunday, That's right. Come on. or in the middle of the week, or anything else, 
I need to have heard from the Lord. Yes. Don't I? Yes. I, I, I? People, you know, get upset with me before about, you know, I want you to do this and that. I've looked at them and I said, I don't do what I want to do. Why would I do what you want me to do? <laughs> we actually have a big boss. I know a lot of folks don't act like it, but he's real. You should get your orders from the big boss. And if folks don't understand that, then they're just baby babies and they need to grow up and learn some things. Don't they? And how did we get off into all of that? I don't know. But I'm not taking it back. I'm... Verse 16. The Spirit Himself does what? He bears witness with what part of our being? Our spirit. That, he, that we're the children of God. If he could let you know internally in your spirit that you're a child of God, he could let you know something else. That means he can communicate with you. Go back to the, uh, well, let's see. Don't go back there right now. Go over to uh, John, the eighth chapter. Genesis, the third chapter. Why don't you find that too? You might think I was digressing through all that, but all of that is just different examples of paying attention, isn't it? To your conscience, to what's going on inside you, not being led by external pressures, our fears, our needs, or opportunities. Well, this is a great opportunity, great opportunity. That's not a leading. That's not a leading. Well, we can make more money. Were well, you going to be led by money? It was mighty quiet on that one. <laughs> People say, well, everybody would agree that I, or preachers, should not go to anywhere based on money. You see how strong that was? See, that was a good quick amen. But why should you be led by money any more than me? Why? And everybody would agree. No way should we take monies designated for children's home in Nepal and spend it on a car? Do you agree that's, that's wrong? Millions of Christians take God's tithe and spend it on their car, their house, their clothes. How's that any different? <laughs> There's not two sets of rules. One for preachers and one for folks that just go to church. Bible verses are Bible verses. They apply to all of us. This is a different service tonight, isn't it? It's either true or it's not. Go to Genesis 3. You're holding that? No? Hold those two and go back to Romans, the eighth chapter. We didn't get through with that. Romans 8 and verse 1. And get ready to shout. It may take you a few minutes to warm up to the shout, but I just said get ready. Get, get, you know how they used to have those old, old pumps? You have to prime them a little bit, pour some water in there. Well, go ahead and prime your shouter and just have it ready. Have it ready. <laughs> so everybody else is not shouting and you're sitting there wondering what happens. You, know? you're, you're, you join right in when it's time. <laughs> Romans 8 and verse 1. 
Boy, the Spirit of God says something to me about this this week that is just, mm, it's a jewel, brother. I mean, it's, it's a sparkling diamond. And it's right here. And I hadn't seen it before. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. There's therefore now no. And the revelation is in this word no. N-O. That word no literally means in the Greek, it means not even one. None. Somebody say not even one. None. That's how much condemnation you're supposed to have. Not even one. None. Not any. Now, I would hope you'd believe that, reading it right out of the book of Romans. Yes. But how many Christians do you suppose actually live with zero condemnation? <laughs> zero. Now, condemnation literally means to a judge against. It means to judge guilty. So when we're talking about a conscience offended, we're talking about what you hear the term, a guilty conscience. And if you've got any guilty conscience, you've got condemnation. Any. And how much are you supposed to have? Zero. Not even one. None. None. Let's read that verse again. There is therefore now, now because of what Jesus has done, now because him who knew no sin was made sin with our sin, took our condemnation, took our judgment, took our punishment, took our place because he did that. Now, there is not even one little bit, none, condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now, we got into this last time that there are two huge keys to walking with a clear conscience, getting, getting free from a guilty conscience. Number one is faith in the blood of the Lamb. Faith in, that, faith in that blood to cleanse you. The Bible said in Hebrews that under the old covenant, the, under the law, the blood of bulls and goats could cover the sin, but they could not take away the guilty conscience. They could not cleanse the conscience. That's why it kept having to be done every year. Remembrance was made of the sin. Everybody say remembrance. remembrance. When remembrance is made of sin, you cannot live free from guilt. But in the new covenant, remembrance is not made of sin. He said there's sins and iniquities I will remember. No, no. No more. And there is therefore now, because of that, in O, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Not even one. None. No condemnation. Mm. We're going to have to camp on this a while. Mind renewal is, is required here. I'm excited. You are believing with me, right, to get this out. I, I can't get this out on my own. And you and I can't get it on our own. But we're not on our own. We've got the Holy Spirit. He's in us. He's working through us. He's helping us. I'm talking about something here that will absolutely rip out a thousand years of unbiblical tradition. Yes, 
and remove the barriers to our faith. What did 1 John say? Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God and whatever we ask, we receive. This is a faith that won't be denied. This is a faith that can receive anything. But what's got to be removed? The condemnation which is the, the guilty conscience. Go with me to uh, Genesis, the third chapter. After what Jesus has done, if we'll put faith in, in what he's done and faith in his cleansing blood and the second thing we talked about, which is the latter part of that verse, those that walk not in the flesh but in the spirit. If you walk in the light of what you know, we talked about this. If you do those two things, how much condemnation or guilty conscience should you have? How much? How much? How much is none? Not even one. That's what it literally, the Greek definition, look it up, says not even one, none. How much of a guilty conscience? None. In Genesis 3, you see the beginning of the guilty conscience. When did it happen? When Adam and Eve sinned. What did God tell them about the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He, he commanded them not to eat of it and he warned them that if they did, they would die. Romans talks about this in the, in the uh, sixth chapter and other places, that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Let's read it and then we'll, we'll elaborate. In the third chapter, after they had eaten the, the fruit that they were not supposed to, after they had sinned, uh, verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Now, this would not be here unless this is something new that they had never done. If they, this was something they'd done before, you wouldn't put it here like it's some new thing. They'd never done this before. Everybody awake? If they've never done this, what did they do? What did they do? They heard the sound of the Almighty, creator of the heavens and earth, coming towards them. And prior to this, without any reservation or any fear, they came right into his presence. The Almighty. The perfect, pure, holy God. They never thought about hiding. They never thought about being scared. They've, they've known this from the time they were created. This is normal. Absolute boldness and confidence and comfortableness in the light unapproachable for sinful man. They'd never withdrawn. They'd never pulled back. They were never scared. Now, do you know who we're talking about? Yes, Eve, do you hear him? Yeah, let's go. He just run right, in, right into his presence. Fellowship with him with no reservations, no, not the least bit of inhibition. 
That's the plan of God. That's why God made us. That's how it's supposed to be. But, when you sin, what happens? What God say would happen? Death. And death is the, the punishment for being guilty. When you sin, you're guilty. And if you're guilty, you deserve to be punished. And if you know you're guilty, and you know the punishment is coming, it's fearful. And you know death is headed for you. Fear is there. You cannot be fear free until you are condemnation, guilt free. Are you with me, friends? You cannot be fear free until you are guilt free. Let me say it again. Say it with me. You cannot be fear free until you are guilt free. Because as long as you have guilt, why do you have guilt? Because you've sinned. What's the due punishment for sin? Death. And if you know death is coming, you're going to be afraid. I'm not talking about just dying physically for the believer. I'm talking about spiritual death. I'm talking about separation from God. I'm talking about destruction. I'm talking about punishment. Don't just take my word for it. I didn't think you would anyway, but hold your place there. First John, hold your place in, in Genesis and go to First John. The fourth chapter. I need a few minutes extra time tonight. Can you, can you spare it? 1 John 4, and uh, 17. Herein is our love made perfect to what end? That we may have what? Boldness. Boldness. Now... Where? <laughs> Boldness in the day of judgment when others are crying to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And we just step out in the open and go, it's daddy. <laughs> it's daddy. <laughs> You'll never do that if you have guilt. Do you remember uh, Peter's first encounter with Jesus? Jesus came through, the crowd was following him. He came down, they were pulling out their boats from a hard night of fishing, having taken nothing. And Jesus asked them, can I use your boat? Here's this traveling preacher they never saw before with this mob behind him wants to use your boat. You're tired. It's late. You want to go home. You're hungry. You need to sleep. You got to go work. You work the night shift. You got to go back to work in a few hours here. Old friends, the Bible uh, exhorts us about being hospitable because it said some have entertained angels without even knowing it. And in this case, it was the Lord himself. We're given opportunities all through life. And there are situations that make all the difference in the following course of our life. Amen. What if he'd have said, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time. You need to find somebody else. Well, you wouldn't be reading about Peter, would you? <laughs> It'd be Boudreaux or somebody else, you know. <laughs> But 
He did. He said, yes, sir, you, you can sure use my boat. And they stayed there with him because when he's through, they got to finish putting everything up. And, you know, it's going to be time to go back to work. Time this is all over. But they did. Thank God. And uh, when Jesus is through, he's preached a long message. And they may be thinking we're through. And he says, no, what you need to do now <laughs> is launch out into the deep and cast, uh, throw out your nets for, for a catch. Wow. And it was, he was not ready to just jump on this, was he? He said, that's great, you know. But man, we, have, we, we, we just fished all night before you got here and preached this long message. Uh, <laughs> but, but thank God he didn't stop. He said, nevertheless, because you say so. Something must have impressed him about that message. Hmm? This is his first encounter. Because at your word, because you said so, we will do it. So they launched out, they threw out the net, and my oh, word, more fish yeah. than they had seen in months. This is money in their pocket. Yeah. This is paying all the bills. This is catching everything up. And you know what Peter does? He backs up in the back of the boat and says, Lord, you need to get away from me. I'm a sinful man. This is the greatest day of his life so far. He, his money problems have just been taken care of. He's heard words like he's never heard in his life. This man is spending some personal time with him and showing him love. And he says, go away. Get away from me. Why? It's not because he didn't want to be around him. What was the problem? He came face to face. With the love of God, the purity of God, the power of God. He just saw a miracle. He knows this is a miracle. He knows this is a miracle. He knows this is God. And, and he comes face to face with God in his boat. And he goes, you need, to, you need to leave. I'm sinful. That's what a guilty conscience will do to you. It will cause you to run away from the best thing that ever happened to you. It will cause you to draw back in fear when you should be drawing near yes. and moving forward. Amen. Good you know what Jesus told him? Fear not. <laughs> you know, he said that quite often, didn't he? Fear not, Peter. You're going to catch some men. We're catching fish today. But soon and very soon, you're going to be a man catcher. I believe his words brought faith to Peter. He was able to overcome his sense of shame and guilt and inferiority. Wasn't he? And stay with him. And the Bible said they left everything and followed him. And they were with him for, what, those three plus years. Everywhere he went, everything he did. But do you see, before he could get rid of the fear, he had to get rid of the guilt. He had to overcome that. And how, what enabled him to overcome that? When this man, he, he doesn't know this is the Son of God. He doesn't know this is Messiah yet. This is the first time he's ever met this man. When this man looks at him and says, fear not. You know what he saw? He saw love. You know what he heard? He heard love. You know what he felt? He felt love and that love pushed out his fear. 1 John 4, are you looking at it? 1 John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have what? boldness even in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world verse 18 there is what there's that word again N-O how much not even one none 
There is no fear in love. But perfect love, don't let that word perfect throw you. In our modern vernacular, when we hear perfect, we think flawless, without defect, and unattainable. No, fully developed might be a good way to say it. When, when love is fully developed in you, it will push out every bit of fear. And if you still got a lot of fear in you, you need a lot more love developed in you. And we're talking about primarily, first and foremost, a revelation of how much he loves you. People say, well, I already know that God loves me. Not nearly enough. <laughs> you know how you could tell you're having a full revelation of how much God loves you? You'd have zero fear. And zero guilt. And zero condemnation. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has Torment. Now the word torment that's translated here is in other places the same word translated punishment. Punishment. Fear has punishment. Or fear has is King James. Let me read it to you from the complete Jewish Bible. There's no fear in love. On the contrary, love that has achieved its goal gets rid of fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. In other words, why are you afraid? Because you believe punishment is coming. Why? Because you're guilty. Why? Because you sinned. And if you can't get rid of the guilt, you can't get rid of the fear. Because that's why you got the fear. But to those who are in Christ Jesus, yeah. <laughs> And don't walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. To them, there is now no, no. no. Not, even one. not even one, none <laughs> condemnation. That 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 word means guilt. When you hear the, the word condemnation in the King James is also translated damned, and it's a little bit confusing if you haven't looked up the words. So such and such is damned, and when people hear that, they think burning in hell. It, no. It means guilty. Same word. Condemned. Guilty. Back to Genesis. When uh, they heard the Lord coming, they did something different than they had ever done before. Never had they been afraid of him. Does this take mine renewal or not? That a human being could be three feet from the Almighty who created the stars and planets, who is perfection. Oh, the angels cry, holy, holy, holy in His presence all day. And you can be this close to Him and not have one feeling of inferiority or shame. So most folks say, that's not possible. That's how it was. Before sin. People say, yeah, but this is after sin. It's after Christ. Right. Right. <laughs> and Christ has taken care of the sin. How many believe this is big? Is this, is this big? This is New Testament. This is redemption. This is why Jesus went to the cross. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What's making them do this? Well, ver verse 9, read it. The Lord God called to Adam, Adam, where are you? You reckon he knew where he was? <laughs> 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 
Adam. And where's Adam? The Almighty is calling your name. He's right there. You can hear him. And what's he doing? Hiding behind a bush. <laughs> Forgetting God made the bush. <laughs> and the planet the bush is planted in. Where are you? Verse 10. He said, I heard your, your voice, the sound of you coming in the garden. And what? And what? And what? I was afraid because I, I was naked and I hid myself. Verse 11, God said, who told you? You were naked. Why would you be afraid? What has changed from yesterday or the day before or the day before? Who told you? You know, and, and, and again and again, this is the case. When people change and they become fearful and everything's going off the rails. They've been listening to somebody else. That's where the change started. He knows. They've been listening to the evil one. That's what he wants to know. Who told you this? And then he, the rest of the thing that happened there. He was fearful because he had a guilty conscience. He had a guilty conscience because he had sinned. And the wages of sin, the punishment, the pay, the results of sin is death. And there's fear when you know you're guilty and you're afraid it's going to be found out and the hammer's going to drop at any moment. You cannot be free. You cannot be confident. And your faith is, you know, condemnation is the confidence killer. It absolutely pulls the rug out from under your faith. Which is why we talked about it before. When they, those guys brought that man paralyzed and they tore off the roof and they let him down in front of Jesus. Why is he there? He's paralyzed. He wants to walk. And what's the first thing the Lord told him? Your sins are forgiven. Caused an uproar amongst the Pharisees and Sadducees. Why? Why did he say that first? Because he's about to tell him, take up your bed and rise and walk. And he knows he won't have the confidence and boldness to step up and do that until he gets rid of this guilt caused by this sin. Can you say glory to God? Glory. glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. You still got John 8? I'm believing for a good place to, to finish here, but I don't want to cut you short. Uh, John 8. Paul said in our text, he said, I always am, am striving, to, making the effort to maintain, to keep my conscience clear. What does that mean? Anything that bothered him, he's going to do what he needs to do to get that fixed. If, how can you get it fixed? We, we talked about this in detail. There's two basic ways you get it fixed. Number one, you confess it. And you ask the Lord to forgive you. Right? And you don't stop there. You believe what he said, that he forgives you of all your sin and he cleanses you from all unrighteousness. And if you're forgiven, you're forgiven. If you're clean, you're clean. I've had people look at me and say, yeah, but preacher, you don't know what I've done. I said, yeah, and you don't know how powerful the blood is. That's right. It doesn't matter what you've done. 
You must receive that and, and receive your cleansing, receive your forgiveness. He's the glory and the lifter of your head. Mm. Isn't he? But that's not all. What else must you do? We talked about it. You must walk in the light you have. If you know what to do, you must do it. If you don't do what you know to do, the Bible says to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it's sin. If you're not doing what you know, your heart's going to condemn you. That's not the Holy Spirit condemning you. That's your own heart condemning you, but it's still condemnation. It's guilt. John 8. We may have to save some of this for next time, but uh, we can get to a good unhooking place. Are you still with me? Yes, sir. Can we go just a little bit further? Yes, sir. John 8. They found the woman, they said, taken in the act of adultery. They brought her and throwed her in front of Jesus. They said, the law says stoner. What do you say? This is not about this woman. She's a pawn in this thing. This is about making Jesus look bad. They want him to publicly uh, contradict Moses in the law. Now this tells you a lot about him. They were so confident in his compassion. <laughs> they thought they had him. <laughs> they were so confident that he would be merciful and he would be compassionate that they figure we got him because there's no way he's going to say stoner. That's who Jesus is. He is the compassionate. He is the merciful. But he didn't just answer. He, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground as though he heard him not and they kept accusing him and going, what do you say? What do you say? Stoner you don't. Stoner you don't. This is a perfect example of not being led by pressure. I believe, he's, I believe he's looking on the inside. I believe he's looking to the Father. Somebody said, he's God. Yes, but he's operating as a man. He, he didn't operate with some unfair advantage over us and then tell us to live like him. That wouldn't be fair. And uh, finally he stood up. Do you remember what he did? And he said, whoever is without sin among you can throw the first rock. <laughs> and then he just went back, stooped back down and was doing what he was doing. And the Bible said, verse 8 and 9, when they heard it, what happened? They were convicted by what? their own conscience and they went out one by one starting with the oldest why they've lived longer made more mistakes <laughs> should, should have a little more wisdom and perspective the young ones were so full of pride it took them longer to figure it out youth are particularly susceptible to pride because of what they don't know uh, they went out and, and, and finally none of them are there just Jesus and the woman everybody's gone except them verse 10 Jesus lifted up himself and, and he saw none but the woman he said woman where's your accusers has no man condemned you there's nobody here to condemn you anymore. They're all gone. No, not one. There is one man left. Jesus. And he is without sin. If anybody is qualified to judge her, it's him. He says, has nobody condemned you? No man? Verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. 
Not me either. The one who could. Didn't. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. To judge them guilty. But through him that they might be saved. I want you to notice, though, two very important things that Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, you didn't sin. He didn't say, it was okay. He didn't say, you're fine just like you are. He didn't condemn her, but nor did he condone it. Forgiveness is available to her. But what else? I don't condemn you. But what else? Go and sin. So she did. She did sin. Right? But he's not, I'm not going to condemn you over it. But what? Don't do it anymore. She needs to receive that forgiveness. Right? What else does she need to do? She needs to walk in the light doesn't she of what he just told her and do what he told her she leaves no stones no condemnation I mean if it had been up to them she would have died right there wouldn't she you reckon she had any fear of punishment she knows she's guilty of sin and they got rocks in their hands and they're here to prove a point with her You know she had fear. You know she was terrified. No stoning, no punishment, no condemnation. Jesus didn't shame her. Just go. Don't do it again. Glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Say it again, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Go back to Romans 2, and I think I'll close with this. And I don't think we're through with this. We're going to have to camp on this some more. Hope you can come back another Friday night. If you can't, if you're visiting, you know we're on live on the internet on Friday nights. Or you can come anytime and download it in its entirety. It won't cost you anything. Technology is wonderful. I know people are using it for some bad stuff, but I believe this is why God gave us the understanding of it is just for things like this. Get the word out. Romans 2, we read this, but I want us to read it again. Romans 2.15. In the New Living Translation. It says, they demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts accuse them or tell them that they're doing right. The New Century, the NCV, the New Century version says it like this. They show that in their hearts they know what is right and wrong, just as the law commands. And they know this by their consciences. Sometimes their thoughts tell them they did wrong, and sometimes their thoughts tell them they did right. And we're supposed to listen to that. The Lord revealed something to me, uh, it's been 25 years ago, and I just saw some things about it this week. We were having a meeting at a small church. And some people we had known years before, some very uh, young couple, had come to the meeting, and they got to the Lord and got filled with the Spirit in that meeting. Glory Glory to God. Wonderful. They were so excited. Well, a few months later, we were coming back through that area. We saw them, able to spend a little time with them. And I asked the young lady, I said, uh, everything going good, you know, since you gave your heart to the Lord? You've been been in in church, you've been reading your Bible in it. And she kind of hung her head and she said, well, you know, no. And she said, you know, I guess none of us could read our Bible enough. And there were some other people in the room and they said, yeah, you know, that's right. And boy, something bothered me. 
about that. I didn't say anything because I didn't know what it was that bothered me. I just kind of grunted and we went on to some other subject. And uh, uh, later, praying, that came back to my mind and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what's wrong with that? You know, you hear that kind of thing all the time. Well, I guess none of us, you know, pray enough. I guess none of us read our Bible enough. I guess none of us could praise the Lord enough. I guess none of us could be thankful enough. I guess none of, that, that's just a standard thing. Do you know so much of what Christians think is normal, is actually abnormal, Amen. is actually contrary to Scripture? And this is contrary to Scripture. But it is steeped in tradition. I, I heard a holy cow grunt <laughs> right then. Did, did you hear? She went, because we kicked her. It's just getting started. We're going to run right over. People say, well, what's certainly? Friends, this, I'm about to tell you, is taught in whole denominations. There are whole groups. I'm, I'm talking about millions and millions and millions of Christians in their group. They are taught this, that you are a sinner. Saved, hopefully, eventually, in the end, by grace. But you are a sinner. And what that means is that you sin every day. And you're going to sin. And there's really not much escaping that. And thank God you can be forgiven. But you are a sinner. And that's what you've done and that's what you're going to do. And so nobody is shocked in these groups when even their ministers commit the most grievous sins. They expect to sin. And they'll just tell you, well, I'm just a man. I'm a sinner. But, and we're imperfect. And we make mistakes. And we all make so many mistakes every day. Did you hear the holy cow grunt? Yes. <laughs> Where is that in the New Testament? What, is that Bible? Is that New Testament? If you really believe that you are continuously sinning and you are going to keep on doing it throughout your life no matter what, how will you ever get free from a guilty conscience? Amen. And how will you ever get free from fear of the impending punishment because of all the mistakes and sins that you've made? You cannot. You will not. I'm, I'm sharing with you some of what I've just seen recently about what he told me 25 years ago. This is what he told me 25 years ago. I said, Lord, what's wrong with that? Because the young lady said, well, I guess none of us read our Bible enough. Now, let, let's just stop right here. If she believes that there's never a day in her life when she reads her Bible as much as she should, is she ever going to get free from condemnation? No. She can't. She's, she's living with guilt about things little and large that she did or has not done or is not going to do. Is she living in zero condemnation? No. no. She's living in a lot of condemnation. Now the question is, how much condemnation are you living in? Or me or any of us? How much do we have to live in? Put it up on the screen. Romans 8, 1. What does it say? There is, therefore. Now. Not in the sweet by and by. Now. How much? No. Don't you like that little word tonight? No. Don't you like that little word? No means not even one, none. 
no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Does the blood have the power to wash you completely clean and to make you holy? Does it? Now the second part's up to every one of us. Are you willing to walk in the light of what you know? And if he tells you, don't do that, that's wrong. Do this, you're supposed to do this. If you're willing, see, if you know what you're supposed to do and you won't do it, you're still not going to be able to get free from condemnation because your own heart knows you're not doing what you're supposed to do. But if you will do that, it's possible. Do you believe it's possible to live with zero sense of guilt and as a result, zero fear? Zero. 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 I mean the bulk of the blessings in the Word of God. Christians will hear them, they'll shout, but afterwards the devil will say, yeah, but now you know, if, if you were holy, and if you were a real good Christian, and if you'd spend a lot more time praying and, and all that, you know, maybe you could have some of that, but you know. You know how you are. And you know how far you come short. And you know, you know, and the sad thing is, this has been preached to Christians all their life from pulpits. And they go, yeah, I know, I know. I, I am a sad excuse for a Christian. And I'm, I'm just a man. And I sin. I know I do. I, I sin all the time. I know it. I know it. I know it. But I just, I just hope some way, by the mercy of God, I can make it in them pearly gates. That's not the Bible. That's not the New Testament. That's right. It's not humility. Amen. It's ignorance. Mm -hmm. It's deception. Mm -hmm. It's religion that's contrary to the Word of God. I, uh, I said, Lord, what's wrong with that? I didn't know. It bothered me, but I didn't know why. Because I've heard that kind of thing all my life. I guess none of us could you know, really give enough. I guess none of us could really pray enough. I guess none of us could really, you know, you could never read your Bible enough. And, and, and man, it bothered me. And I thought, Lord, what's wrong with that? And he spoke to my heart. I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside me he said, Keith, do you believe I'm unreasonable? I thought, no, sir. He said it again. Do you believe I'm unreasonable. I am unpleasable. Do you believe that about me? I said, no, sir. He said, well, then you can read your Bible enough. That's right. You can give enough. You can pray enough. If you can't, is he unpleasable? You can't please him? Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. Jesus completely pleased the Father every day and night of every one of his days down here. And he had to wash and take a bath and he, and he ate and he slept and they rode in boats. And he wasn't preaching 24-7. He wasn't reading the scripture 24-7. He wasn't praying 24-7. It's possible to completely please God every day of your life. All you got to do is follow your conscience. If you're reading your Bible and you go to quit and your heart bothers you a little bit like you're not through, you may, ju you may be 15 minutes away. That may be all the more you need. The Lord knows you got a job. He knows you got kids. He knows all that. Yes, he does. But the problem is, people have made the choice to just live 
in condemnation, just not even trying to get free from it, just accepting that I'll never do well enough and I'll never, we'll never go far enough and we're, we're just old sinners. No. no. No, you were old sinners. You have been saved by the grace of God. You are not old sinners anymore. It's possible to go days and weeks and months and not sin. Are you listening? Jesus went his entire life. Now I've sinned, so have you. But the very fact that you had to repent means you could have done differently. We're embarking into an area that'll take us into the spirit, into the supernatural, like we have not been before. You get rid of the condemnation. You get rid of the fear. You get rid of the fear, the confidence, the boldness rises up. And instead of pulling back and cutting short and quitting and hanging your head, you lift your head, you step forward, you draw near, and that act of faith activates the power of God. Instead of pulling back and crying about how unworthy you are, you'll step up and step right into the presence of God and stretch forth your hand and it'll be made whole. There is a life, the Jesus life. It's the life of Christ. It's the life Christ lived. A life of no condemnation, no guilt, no shame, no inferiority, no fear, zero fear. A life of fullness of love and fullness of faith that speaks to the wind and waves and they obey. But many say, no, no, you're just a worm. You're just, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. And it was the master who said, if you believe on me, the works I do, shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Oh, it's grieved the heart of the Lord. It's grieved the Spirit of God that millions of God's kids have pulled back and cowered and were told by their own ministers, you're not even fit to pray to God yourself. You have to pray through this one or pray through that one or, or, or you'll, never, you'll always be a sinner. You can't live free from this. Lies, lies, doctrines of devils. For the Holy One has come to make you what you could not make yourself. The Holy One has come to make you righteous, to make you holy, not with what you've done, but with His own precious blood has He done so. Somebody say, I receive it. Somebody say, I, say, I believe it. I believe it. Brother Kenneth Hagin, my uh, father in the faith, had experiences in the Lord, visions, was caught up to heaven. And you have to decide whether you believe these things or not. Certainly your faith shouldn't be just based on what somebody's experience. It should be based in the Word. But if it's right, you'll see it, the principles in the Word. He said... One night in a tent meeting, not expecting at all it to happen. They were praying. 
he heard a voice. Come up. Come up here. He thought it was somebody outside trying to interrupt the service. <laughs> Opened his eyes and saw the master. He said when he looked up where the top of the tent should have been, it just went away. He didn't see the tent anymore. He just saw the Lord and he left his body. He came up. Went up, up, up. Went up to heaven. And among other things, he said, uh, he saw the Lord. He said, I saw him just like I see you. And he said he had been with him for a few minutes and he told him some things, but he had never really just looked right at him. But he said he turned and looked at him. People asked him, what does he look like? And he described some of the physical attributes, but he said the most remarkable thing about him was his eyes. He said he couldn't describe it, but it looked like, he said they looked like pools or wells of living love. He said it looked like you could look down into a mile deep Thank you, Lord. and just love, living love. And he said when he did, he was just overwhelmed and he just fell on his face. And when he did, he said he noticed that the Lord's feet were bare and he saw the marks that the nails had put in them. And he just fell on his face and said, Oh Lord, no one as unworthy as I should look on your face. And I reckon you'd feel that way. But I want you to hear the next thing that happened. He said, The Lord spoke and said, Stand up. Stand up on your feet. He said, He stood up trembling. He said, The Lord said, I have made you worthy. I have made you worthy. Do you believe that? I believe that. We're nothing because of who we are intrinsically or what we've done. But we're not just sinners and unworthy either. Because of what he's done. We have been made. The righteousness of God in Christ. Not ours, His. Is His good enough? Is His good enough for you to not feel guilty and ashamed in the presence of God? Is His good enough for you to not fear judgment and punishment? Stand on your feet.